Um, all right, so thank you so much uh, for gathering today, um, this foggy but warm morning. So we will be talking about the female suspects of complaints in IPV police contact, specifically focusing on understanding the nuances in subsequent police contact and recidivism outcome. So uh, this is part of my master thesis, and this uh, research was also done in collaboration with the Center for Criminal Justice Studies. Dr. Marianne Campbell is the director of this center. So let's start. Uh, we'll start with the definition of intimate partner violence or IPV as a means of coercive, threatening, harassing, and violent behavior, which is used to dominate and control an intimate partner in a former current relationship. IPV is a widespread societal problem. However, um, the health consequences and financial costs and the general societal burden stemming from this behavior did not really come to the attention of uh, researchers, law enforcement, and policymakers until uh, approximately the 70s. And prior to this period, IPV was considered mostly a private uh, matter. Since then, however, the IPV, the topic of IPV, was rediscovered in broader social context, um, although much of this work um, right now focused only on male to female IPV perpetration. So um, let's look at some uh, statistics. So statistics across countries um, show that indeed females are the predominant victims of IPV. For example, uh, Canadian Center for Justice Statistics identified that almost 80,000 of women were victimized by their intimate partners in Canada in 2017, in comparison with slightly more than 20,000 of male IPV victims. The difference uh, between the number of female and male victims is apparent. However, there is some research that states that maybe the rates of IPV as perpetrated by women might be slightly underrepresented or underreported in some of the family violence statistics. For example, uh, the National Center for Injury Prevention and Control in the US reported that men can experience or experienced physical and sexual violence and or stalking by the intimate partners at slightly at approximately similar rates to the ones found um, by by the um, with, in comparison with violence experienced by women. Moreover, almost 50% of men reported experiencing psychological abuse, which was also at comparable rates with the ones um, found or experienced by women. Thus, um, at least we can state that IPV can be uh, perpetrated, but also experienced by men and women. So uh, more and more research is emerging right now that highlights the specificity of female IPV perpetration. And thus, to kind of move this field forward, it's crucial for researchers to identify uh, the uh, characteristics of female IPV perpetrators, the dynamics of the use of violence in intimate relationships, and to clarify common as well as gendered risk factors for reoffense or police recontact among female subjects of complaint. Such valuable data is needed to inform theoretical understanding of um, female IPV behavior and to develop effective uh, risk management and intervention strategies. To develop these risk mitigation strategies, researchers and professionals in the field must first understand how best um, to appraise IPV risk for male and uh, female subjects of IPV complaint. So let's talk a little bit about some background. So it's quite crucial to understand IPV characteristics and IPV risk factors um, for our better grasp of uh, such a complex um, issue as IPV. So in terms of demographics, uh, research shows that um, female offenders tend to be younger than male offenders and younger than their victims. 
Research also shows that uh, female offenders are less likely to be married. In terms of relationship dynamics, uh, there is some research that shows that um, women um, often use violence with the desire to gain or establish control, uh, with the desire to harm, hurt, or intimidate their partners, um, as well as for such reasons as self-defense and jealousy. Uh, there is also uh, some research that uh, stated that both men and women tend to minimize, deny, and blame various external factors for IPV, uh, with more women doing this in comparison with men. Um, in terms of criminal history, Hannon and Fed found that male IPV offenders had a greater likelihood of having a history of um, domestic violence perpetration, as well as general violent incidents and previous nonviolent criminality in comparison with their female counterparts. In contrast, uh, there was no significant differences in the history of juvenile arrests or childhood exposure of violence to violence in the respective homes of uh, female and uh, male IPV perpetrators. Cho and Wilker also found that women tended to use weapon much more often than men. However, the level of injury inflicted by women is often lower um, due to the differences in physical strength, which is often found between males and females. Um, and sometimes female IPV perpetrators tend to be arrested less often. Research also has shown the connection between substance use, specifically alcohol and cocaine, and the likelihood of IPV perpetration for both men and women. Um, Capaldi and colleagues, for example, argued that uh, there is evidence that alcohol was a more significant risk factor for girls and women who perpetrate IPV than for men, which might be explained by a more disinhibitory effect that alcohol has um, on, on women, as well as male partners' attitude to the female's alcohol use or the association between alcohol use and various mental health vulnerability. Okay. Research has also indicated uh, the association between borderline and antisocial or psychopathic personality traits and the likelihood of IPV perpetration. For example, um, Heinz found that borderline personality traits were predictive of IPV for both men and women in a non-clinical sample. Additionally, McKay and colleagues uh, reviewed 31 studies on female-specific IPV perpetration and concluded that personality, borderline personality traits were strongly associated with IPV perpetrated by women. Um, although borderline traits might more strongly tied to IPV perpetration for women specifically. There is also some study um, done by Gray and Snowden, for example, that found that psychopathic traits correlated with general criminal and aggressive behavior for both men and women. Moreover, Moza, who actually is a former member of our lab, she found that psychopathic um, traits were more strongly predictive of IPV recidivism for both genders in comparison with the standardized uh, risk assessment tools. Um, and they were especially predictive for female IPV perpetrators. So ideally, these traits should be considered um, as a part of theoretical explanation of IPV perpetration. So this all kind of is bringing us to our study, which was um, this part was purely exploratory in nature. So what we wanted to do is to look at a more nuanced recidivism outcomes, um, because we think that it may present interesting avenues for further risk assessment conversations and intervention planning. Uh, the majority of available research on IPV uh, explores risk factors and characteristics that can predict um, 
new church or conviction recidivism, as well as the influence of arrest on IPV recidivism patterns. However, to the best of our knowledge, um, there is no research examining the differences between the groups of IPV suspects, subjects of complaint, based on their patterns of recidivism that um, explores risk for new police contact separately from the um, less common outcomes of being arrested or charged. And um, looking at the characteristics of um, groups of female IPV subjects of complaint from the, this perspective of different patterns of recidivism might present um, a more nuanced understanding of the nature of IPV as well as its persistence. So uh, to do this, uh, we collected a total of 151 uh, female IPV case files from two neighboring police agencies at the province of New Brunswick. The data were collected from April 2009 to September 2019 and followed for at least 12 months. Um, all cases that we collected had to meet certain inclusionary criteria. So to be included in the current study, the victim and the perpetrator uh, were um, currently or previously involved in intimate relationship. Police were called uh, due to disturbance or altercation, um, which was described as a dispute or assault or domestic call between the current or former intimate partners. Uh, the roles of the victim and the perpetrator were clearly identifiable in the uh, record, and the violence used by the perpetrator was clearly directed at the intimate partner. We had these two clauses specifically because we wanted to focus uh, specifically on, on the violence perpetrated by women, and we try to exclude all of the cases, we excluded all of the cases uh, that had the instances of mutual violence. Um, also, the perpetrator uh, must be over the age of 18, and all the cases must be concluded with a certain legal resolution, such as arrested, found guilty, found not guilty, charges withdrawn, case closed, and so on. Um, we used a number of measures. So one of them was um, our coding guide. And the coding guide was used to capture victims and um, suspects' descriptive characteristics, including age, gender, ethnicity, employment situation, substance use concerns, and the presence of mental health vulnerabilities. Uh, moreover, the coding guide was used to capture the situational details of the indexed um, IPV occurrence, as well as subsequent recidivism. And I'll talk um, about the recidivism coding in particular slightly later in the presentation. Um, what I also want to mention here is that all this information was extracted based on victim, perpetrator, um, witnesses, and police officers' account of an incident, as well as photo evidence. As you can imagine, the coding um, might here be a little bit subjective um, because victims, um, as well as perpetrators, they can give you know kind of contradictory information so in this case what we did we tried to be more objective by relying on photo evidence for example or by relying on the account of police officers um, the next measure that we used was a psychopathic borderline trait scale so um, that's the scale which was um, originally developed by Moser based on hair psychopathy checklist revised. And it included um, a lot of the items related to the manifestation of psychopathic traits, uh, such as shallow emotions um, or manipulativeness and deceitfulness. And later on, the scale was expected by MacTag to include, um, based on the existing research, uh, the borderline personality traits because of their strong connection with IPV perpetration and IPV recidivism. So uh, the scale was expect expanded to include such items as 
relationship instability, for example, or the fear of rejection and abandonment. And the whole scale, which included 18 items, it was scored from um, zero to two with zero, um, no characteristic of information present and two clear presence of these characteristics. Uh, we also utilized uh, two scales developed by Messin in 2007. One of them is the linear violence scale or L scale, which is utilized to measure the severity of violence, which was either perpetrated or attempted by an IPV perpetrator. So for example, if a person tried to punch their partner, but this punch was kind of a miss, or there was no physical injury left, uh, this scale um, was used to code this as um, you know, an instance of the violence which was um, perpetrated, which was attempted. Um, L injury scale, in contrast, was used to record only the instances of um, physical injury inflicted by the IPV partner during the altercation. And both of these skills, um, the, 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 the level, so to speak, of the violence, um, which was attempted to use, as well as the level of injury inflicted, um, it's measured in a five-point scale. So in terms of uh, procedure, um, after receiving our ethics approval, the members of the research team received the clearance from police agencies. And then we got the access to police databases from which the cases were actually drawn. All of the cases that were drawn from uh, police databases, they were reviewed and coded on site. First, we used a kind of broader definition of um, reoffense, and we defined it um, as a new IPV-related police call, new arrest for IPV behavior, new charge for IPV behavior, and or a new conviction for IPV behavior subsequent to the identified index event. Um, we were very careful to code the dates and the nature of IPV recidivism and to make sure that it was indeed the recidivism, not just the delayed outcomes, legal outcomes of the index event. Uh, what we also did here is we calculated the survival time prior to uh, recidivism in days, which um, reflected the number of days passed between the index event date um, and the recidivism event date minus um, the time spent in custody. Um, so what we found was the following. I would start with the subjects of complaint characteristics. So our subjects of complaint um, in the sample ranged in age uh, from 18 to 74 years with an average age of 33. Uh, most uh, female um, subjects of complaint were Caucasian and approximately one fifth of them were employed at the time of the index event. Slightly more than a third of the sample used drugs and or alcohol uh, during the IPV event. And, where, uh, and almost 9% of uh, women in our sample exhibited suicidal or self-harming tendencies, which included suicidal ideation, self-harm behavior, and attempts of suicide within the year before. In addition, 7% um, of uh, the sample exhibited mental health uh, vulnerabilities, uh, which included depression, anxiety, and bipolar disorder. Um, in terms of the relationship status, uh, more than a half of uh, female subjects of complaint in our sample were involved in intimate relationship uh, with the victim at the time of the index event. 40% of women live together with their victims. Uh, length of relationships uh, for the current partners uh, range from a couple of days up to 420 months. And um, more than 70% of um, women in the study also indicated uh, to police that they experienced current um, relationship problems 
which included, for example, um, frequent and serious conflicts or breakups or infidelity. Um, and almost uh, one, uh, one fifth of the sample uh, exhibited jealousy and excessive control in um, their relationship. We also looked at the triggers for the index altercation. And the first thing that we found is that slightly more than a third of the sample um, were kind of repeat um, offenders, or at least they had uh, some instances of IPV before. Um, however, only 15% of um, these instances were reported to the police. Uh, triggers for index altercation were quite um, often unknown, but when the trigger was known, it included um, arguments, a fight about children, jealousy, money, sex, infidelity, family issue, division of labor, uh, as well as a big groups of reasons which we kind of lumped together and called them miscellaneous. These miscellaneous groups included arguing about breakups, arguing about the use of cell phones, uh, negative comments about women, car driving, and uh, arguments about relationship status. Uh, so L injury scale, um, just a reminder, was utilized to identify the level of injury actually inflicted by the perpetrator during the IPV event. And slightly more than a half of the sample was coded as inflicting no injury and causing no pain whatsoever to the intimate partners. Uh, collectively, um, more than 40% of um, subjective complaints uh, fell into the severity levels two and three, capturing uh, such injuries as uh, marks, scratches, bruises, and cuts without stitches. The level of violence attempted or committed during the index event was scored using the L violence scale, and slightly more than 40% of female. Um, um, suspects of female subjects of complaint in our study fell into the uh, most severe category, which captured attempting or perpetrating such acts of violence as stabbing, punching, biting, and hitting with the object. In addition, 14% of women were categorized as uh, perpetrating or attempting to commit such violence as uh, pushing, slapping, and throwing objects. And finally, um, almost, uh, 23% of perpetrators were coding using such actions as slamming, choking, and grabbing. So uh, we also looked at the mean scores for the psychopathic borderline trait scale or PB trait scale. And we found that the mean score for females in the current sample was moderate uh, in its severity of presence for these personality traits. Um, items of poor anger control, um, impulsivity, unstable personal relationships, as well as emotional instability, yielded the highest mean item scores um, out of the whole scheme. So uh, before comparing the uh, groups of female subjects of complaint on um, their recontact or recidivism outcomes, um, we decided that it was important to explore the factors that were actually predictive of IPV recidivism. And um, what we did first, we looked at the uh, PB traits um, items. Um, so we conducted several receiving operating characteristic curve or ROC analysis, and we used uh, the area under the curve or AUC values. Um, just to note, AUC values between 0.64 and 0.71 show the um, moderate predictive um, validity, whereas the AUC values over 0.71 show a quite large predictive validity. And as you can see uh, from the slide, the total score of PB trade scale was actually robustly predictive of um, you know, recidivism um, for females in the current sample. And such items as manipulativeness, 
antisocial attitudes, criminal versatility, impulsivity, unstable relationships, fear of rejection, and emotional instability were moderately predictive of um, IPV recidivism. Here we go. Yes, now I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Oh, you think it should be? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right. We also looked at whether ill injury and ill violence scales would be predictive of IPV recidivism. But um, as you can see from um, the AEC values, um, both of the scales showed chance prediction for recidivism. Yeah, now it's working for both. Thank you. Uh, so uh, finally, our data revealed that um, our sample kind of broadly falls into three categories. Uh, the largest group of female subjects of complaints um, was the group of those ones um, who did not recidivate. And um, it um, kind of made up on, uh, almost 70%. Uh, the second group of almost 20% um, included females who um, had a new police recontact, which meant that the police were called because there was an altercation happening um, in the household. However, the um, suspect or the subject of complaint in this case was neither arrested nor charged. And the final group, the smallest group of almost 12% included um, those women who were at least arrested. And as you can see, um, kind of different categories fell into this group. So women were arrested, but not charged. They were arrested and charged, and they were arrested, charged, and prosecuted. And we kind of combined them into one group, at least arrest, to maximize statistical power for further analysis. Um, we also just as a kind of reminder, the follow-up period in our time ranged from one to 3,856 um, 3, days, which is slightly more than 10 years. Now, it didn't last long, but that's okay. okay. We're going out there um, in sync. So first, we utilized a number of Fisher's tests um, to look at the differences between these groups of uh, female subjects of complaint. And the Fisher's exact test found that membership in the three um, recidivism outcome groups significantly depended on whether the female uh, subject of complaint had current suicidal tendencies, current mental health issues, and the previous use of weapon. Okay. More specifically, uh, a group of uh, female subjects of complaint who were at least arrested had more instances of suicidal tendencies manifestations, more instances of mental health uh, vulnerabilities as recorded by police or um, you know, mentioned by witnesses or mentioned by the, them themselves and more instances um, of the use of weapon. However, there was no statistically significant difference on um, a bunch of other variables that we use in this analysis, including, for example, ethnicity or employment or relationship status and so on and so forth. We also utilized ANOVA. And uh, the ANOVA identified a statistically significant difference between um, recidivism outcome groups uh, on the PB traits um, total score. Uh, we also conducted the post hoc test, which found that the mean scores uh, for the groups uh, that uh, did not recidivate at all were uh, much were lower in comparison with the groups um, with the women that fell into such groups as new police contact um, and um, the women who fell into the group at least um, arrested. There was, however, no statistically significant differences um, between the two latter group, that is new police contact and at least arrest. And there was no statistically significant differences in some other variables that we included in the analysis, such as, for example, um, 
the suspect's age or the length of a uh, relationship uh, or the risk score on one of the risk assessment tools that we also used in the study. So in summary, uh, data revealed that um, women in our sample could be conceptually categorized in three um, distinct groups based on their patterns of recidivism, including a large groups of women who do not reoffend at all, uh, women whose um, recidivism resulted in an encounter with police, but not in their arrest or charge, and women who recidivated and were at least arrested. Uh, differences between these uh, three groups um, were examined, and the most uh, prominent group differences occurred for variables that captured suicidal ideation, mental health issues, use of weapon, and uh, the severity of antisocial and borderline personality traits. So uh, the strengths of the current study included the exploration of a variety of personal and situational characteristics, um, and also the uh, personality traits related to IPV behavior, as well as the severity and the presence of violence and injury inflicted by perpetrators. Uh, we also extracted information from police records, and this allowed us to tap into police officers, victims, uh, perpetrators, and witnesses' narratives. In addition, the maximum follow up period in our study was slightly more than 10 years, which is um, kind of longer than in a lot of other studies. Uh, despite the study strengths, uh, there were several limitations, and one of them was um, a smaller than initially planned sample of, IPV, of uh, subjects of IPV complaint. Um, another limitation was the retrospective coding of police files and um, our operationalization of mental health vulnerabilities as well as suicidal ideation were kind of crude uh, because you know, we we're not really looking for these traits in our sample. Um, and finally, despite a long follow up period, it was not possible to capture all instances of um, recidivism if um, the subject of complaint left the province, or if they reoffended under different jurisdiction, or if the case was simply not reported to the police. So, in So um, in terms of future direction, um, it's needed to kind of further explore the mental health vulnerabilities, including suicidal ideation using more suitable diagnostic tools. Um, so that maybe the assessment of mental health vulnerabilities can be incorporated into risk assessment in some more user-friendly way. Um, moreover, we need to look at a broader list of unique female-specific IPV risk factors, uh, maybe tap in into suspects' um, history of both victimization and perpetration. In addition, more research should be done to um, look at the personality traits and uh, the tra the specific of the scale that we did uh, proved to be quite useful across a number of studies. Maybe we need to look further also into the um, validation or potential modification of this scale. And um, overall, this research calls for further exploration of female-specific IPV risk factors, um, as well as more suitable tools for um, assessment of female IPV reoffense. Thank you. I'm ready to answer all and any of your questions. Thank you, Nina. This is a really interesting presentation. Thank you. And, uh, very important work. I have some questions, and you've already sort of talked about this, but maybe you could expand a bit. So, you know, the popular, like I want to say, media and maybe popular imagination, often uh, perpetrators of violence are 
you know, described as having some kind of psychological or psychological problem, right? Like, oh my God, you know, he's a mm -hmm. monster, or mm -hmm. you know, we never knew that you know, he had this side of him or she had this side of her. And, you know, I wonder how much police are influenced by that, you know, that, that this, you know, this is an individual who has psychological problems or mental health problems, and that's the reason why they're, they're perpetrating mm -hmm. these acts. And so, I don't know if there's any way for you to, 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 well, I don't know, talk about that, because I know you said your measures are crude, they're based on the police, but is yeah. there research on police's sort of objectivity in terms of describing um, the people right. that they're, they're writing about in their records? Right. Um, thank you for your question. So um, we do not specifically look at the attitudes of police officers, um, you know, uh, to the victims as well as perpetrators of IPV, uh, which is in itself a very interesting study. Um, our definition was crude in such a way that we only measured whether there was a clear indication that mental health concerns were present and if there was what it was, whether there was no clear indication of the mental health concerns, whether the indication wasn't clear. That was our operationalization. However, even now there is research that uh, looks at the attitude to um, uh, perpetrators of IPV across uh, different domains, I would say. Um, so in media, for example, it's more often than not, as we all know, and as you have mentioned, uh, that uh, perpetrators are described as monsters, right? There's ones who only have some um, psychopathologists. And um, it is still relevant to our day, unfortunately. For example, um, women are quite often, uh, were quite often, more often than men described as um, more monstrous than they are when they perpetrated IPV because of the existing, um, you know, kind of belief that women cannot do this. So if they did that, there is something wrong with them. Um, when it comes to police uh, specifically, um, I remember one study that um, did not look specifically at that, but they looked at the police officer's attitude to men and women who perpetrated IPV. And um, if um, a man was a victim, um, in vast majority of cases, he was um, much less believed that he was a victim of the domestic incident in comparison with females. Um, so women were believed more, uh, which is understandable enough, you know, on some level, because indeed there are much more, at least that we know of right now, uh, victims of um, intimate partner violence, female victims of intimate partner violence. However, unfortunately, men in this situation would be um, not in a great position because they almost need to defend uh, what happened to them. And um, a little bit of the topic of your question, but if we go further, there is even less research looking at the instances of um, violence, um, you know, between like male to me, male um, IPV or female to female IPV. So we know even less about that. And we know um, even less about the attitude of police officers more specifically um, to the perpetrators and the victims in these cases. And if, yep. I, if I can add to that, Lena, um, what we know is that essentially police officers are very good at appraising mental illness and mental health. So what they, we didn't go for um, when we're coding suicidal self-harm or mental health stuff. It's more a descriptor of the person saying, I have depression, I have anxiety, I need to talk to my mental health counselor. Um, uh, or the person's adding, acting odd and unusual. So we're looking for these kind of indicators. Um, but I think to, to get to your original question, your, your question, um, I think police officers, there is a tendency for uh, police officers, just like the public, to see the behavior as a mental health person. But what we're seeing is that's often not the case. And it's actually more personality driven with the symptoms around emotional dysregulation and the more pro criminal oriented thinking that supports the same things that we see for males who perpetrate this, you know, that uh, I'm entitled and jealous. These kinds of dynamics are also present in the ones that are committing the more serious types of violence. Because one of the things I think that's really notable um, 
in this, the pie graphs that Lena had up there with level of violence and uh, attempted and the actual injury is that if you just base your action on what the injury was, it looks less serious, right? But when you look at what the person, the female subject actually is doing or trying to do, it's more serious. But in our other research, we know police generally inform their decision to arrest or not based on the physical injury that they can observe yeah. because it's subjective, right? So it, all, it makes me wonder how many are missed and that may be why we see police call but less likely to arrest. It's because they don't see the physical evidence to the same degree they would with the male. But it still happened, and I think contributes to the male under reporting yeah. or the female. Uh, we, we, had, we had no specific or criteria for the gender of their partner, uh, but most of them. Most of them, yes. Most of them were um, heterosexual involved in heterosexual relationship. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I'm curious if, uh, based on your findings and lessons learned, if you would envision a need for changes to how New Brunswick is currently approaching its risk assessments um, so as to better be able to predict the potential for recidivism in these types of cases. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, that's a big question, so I would not be able to talk about the whole of New Brunswick. But I can, uh, something that uh, we did not present in this uh, presentation, but something that we looked at also as a part of our broader research was the use of the risk assessment tool, specifically the idea around the area domestic assault risk assessment, which is currently used in the province of New Brunswick as one of the main tools to assess intimate partner violence. Um, so we used the, the use of the data specifically with women who perpetrate um, IPV, and what we found is that the uh, risk assessment tool was not predictive of um, reoffense, uh, which is not surprising. Uh, it's not surprising because this tool was created specifically for the use with men. Uh, it was created based on uh, the data which uh, was received from uh, male IPV perpetrators. So some of the items um, such as, for example, um, assault um, during pregnancy, right, Marianne? So in vast majority of cases, if it's a heterosexual relationship, so it's not going to be applicable, right, even from the get-go. And uh, a lot of these items, they might be tapping more into um, the perpetration of IPV by males. And that's why we call for more gendered approach uh, to the uh, creation of um, IPV risk assessment tools, for example. So yeah, I mean, there is some work that needs to be done uh, in terms of the risk assessment. Maybe Marianne has yeah, something else and, to say. Our, yeah. our research with the Odera, to be fair, it's only developed to be used with men, but it has been used with females in our province, so we need to make sure this works. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. And um, what we found is that only one of the items on the Odera actually predicts subsequent arrest for females, and that's criminal history. Now, if we know females are not getting arrested as often, even that variable, that item is probably going to under under reflected when you do a record search, right? We may be doing it, but it's not documented. What we do find though is that those personality traits actually predict so much better and at a higher level, even for men, than the O'Hara risk tool does. Our question are we need to develop this further because one of our challenges will be whether uh, right now the O'Hara is used with police because it's simple, it's yes, no, this is present. It's information that they normally would have access to and collect, so it makes it efficient for them, uh, which is why they like it. Mm -hmm. um, but this other tool would require some subjectivity, which they're not always as comfortable with. You know, like in, uh, they, the uh, PV trait scale includes things like impulse, well, you saw some of them, but impulsivity, mm -hmm. um, you know, what is impulsivity? We try to define it in a way that is clearly looking for behavioral indicators that allows them would allow a coder to know what to be looking for, but it is going to require a higher level of training. But uh, at this point, we know the Odera is not being scored correctly even for men, so to shift to something a little bit more sophisticated without a, a lot of extra attempt to make sure that, that can be coded correctly by officers 
you know, we're not ready for that, right? Um, but we do need to know that there are some commonalities for risk factors, absolutely. But the ODERA is a static tool that doesn't change over time very much. It doesn't capture, it does not inform anything about what to do to change or reduce your recidivism. It just tells you what the risk is. And then it would prompt a referral for a more involved risk assessment that includes something more dynamic than initial treatment. So it tells you what's the purpose of the risk to be, right? So for cops, it's perfect because it tells you, okay, we need to refer this person to the high intensity domestic violence response, right? The CCR program versus, uh, you know, less intense action. That's what they need. But we need something better for use of equipment because it is certainly happening. Uh, and I think it's getting missed because we don't see the physical. And just to add to that trait, as Marianne has mentioned, because the data is so physical and we have seen that females are not that physical, right, very often. So it might be one of the reasons why the risk assessment is not working that well. And um, that's such a shame whenever I think about them, that uh, personally <laughs> hurts me, because uh, if the risk assessment tool doesn't work, it means um, to me, first and foremost, that people are not getting enough resources. Mm -hmm. So men are referred, but women are not. And uh, it's such a shame that uh, there is virtually nothing nothing that uh, can help women who, uh, you know, might be involved in community in IP. That's exactly where my brain has gone with yeah. that question because of how the affair is used and the ripple effect in terms of like low supervision, access to the types of resources that are wrapped around people and what types of supports we can provide while they're Compliance of justice and public safety, for instance. So exactly. Most people yeah. came up low risk. Yeah. When really, I, <clears throat> as a clinician who assesses risk, I would, based on what I see, probably estimate that risk to be higher when it's changing. So there's under responding. Yeah. yeah. So I know that that came up in Linda Nielsen's study, you know, when they looked at the court records that, you know, the identification of risk was um, inconsistent. In the cases she looked at. So, like, you know, part of the strength of your work, Marianne, is that you're involved with uh, government partners at the table. And, you know, there was a lot of uh, people really pleased that OTERA had been rolled out across province and that you know, the training provided. So, what's the conversation now? Is there an openness to change? Oh, yeah. There's, um, in my conversations with uh, Justice and Public Safety, it's, it's let's let the research inform our practice, which is how we want it to go, yeah. rather than hope for the best. So I've been talking to them and advocating for additional work around training, because we did a really good job of telling you about domestic violence, about how to use, like, how to score the O'Dara when we could work on it, um, but not what to do yeah. with the risk estimate. So the next step in the training is really how do you translate that risk tool information into action, because we are seeing that the O'Dara, regardless of the gender of the subject, like the ODARA tends to be completed a few days to a week later, which means it's not informing the immediate action, which is its intent. So there's a disconnect between how I use this tool to inform my decision versus someone's going to check the box to make sure it's in my file and the crown they want it down the road rather than how it informs my action. So that's the piece that I'm seeing in my research and I'm telling government of that so that that's and they're hearing and listening and understand. So uh, I'm going to expect that and probably uh, helping with that to make sure that people get how this is going to be at least level. So um, there are any more questions? So Skidaddle, thank you so much. Oh, yeah. I just have a question. Sure. For two more so, what's the next step for you? You're in a doctoral program now. So, are you continuing to work with this? Um, not primarily, not as my main research. I'm still involved in um, some of the projects related to IPV, but um, I switched a little bit more to the mental health of uh, first responders in the community. <coughs> yeah. Uh, but this is the topic that's um, near and dear to my heart whenever Marianne has, you know, something else, I always 
want yeah. to be involved but that's an interesting interesting um project and an interesting research that i mean we've together just identified so many branches right where we can go exploring further the the specificity of IPV, exploring further the use of the risk assessment tools or how these risk assessment tools can be improved. So that's a very interesting branch of research. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of our, for one of my other students, we're going to be looking at voice interview strategies for victims of complaint so that we can understand how evidence based it is in terms of strategies that will be. How, how well they reflect trauma informed interviewing, how well they reflect good investigative interviewing styles, open ended questions, telling me all the stuff so I'm just going to teach me vulnerable victims. Um, so that we can also start to perform some training, uh, gaps that might be there, identify them. Um, and uh, we have a police partner for that, which is fabulous. Um, and, uh, but we'll continue to explore the female issues. The, the challenge we have is that. As you see, we, we didn't intend, intend to go back to 2009 to get a sufficient number of female uh, individuals. We had to do that to make our sample size what it is. So in order to do more female-oriented IPV research, we have to uh, collaborate with a number of police agencies to get a big enough sample size that people would let us do so. And uh, I just presented at the New Brunswick Association of Chiefs of Police a couple weeks ago and spoke to the president was anything you want to do, do it. We're willing to help and all this kind of stuff. So I think there's the opportunity there. It's just going to require a break. <laughs> I think those kind of things, but more to be done. Thank you.